thing to my watch. It is now 5.01, and I uh, want to welcome you to this special July 29th meeting of the Escambia County School Board. Whether you're joining us via live stream or in the audience, we appreciate your interest in the education of the students of Escambia County. I want to remind all of you to please turn off your electronic devices. If you would like to speak in the public forum section, uh, forms are available at the back of the room and you can bring them forward to Ms. Dwelly at the front table. This meeting was properly advertised in the Pensacola News Journal on June 16th, 2021. All right, at this time, I'd like to ask everyone to please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. At this time, we would like to move to the adoption of the agenda, Mr. Superintendent. Are there any changes or deletions to your recommended agenda? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We do have two items that have been added. The first is an agreement between the School Board of Escambia County, Florida and the Escambia County, Florida Sheriff's Office for the School Resource Officer Program. The second, agreement between the School Board of Escambia County, Florida and the City of Pensacola Police Department for the School Resource Officer Program. Thank you, sir. I want to make sure that everybody is aware. I think you probably got a phone call today from uh, or a text or email uh, email about the addition of these. And the superintendent and I discussed this and we uh, came to the opinion that uh, because of the School Safety Act, we have to have this in place on the first day of school. So that's the reason it's being added at such a, a late time. So school st uh, state statutes and school board rules require that changes made to the agenda after publication to be based on a finding of good cause determined by the person des designated to preside over the meeting and stated in the record. I do find that these are needed in our agenda. Is there any objection by any board member to this addition? Mr. Chair. Yes. I am not going to object to its being added, but I do want to be on the record. Um, I had a conversation with Ms. Odom. These were not advertised until today, this morning. Our citizens did not have the opportunity to have any information about these being put forth today. And these are expenditures of funds. I realize that both of these contracts, we've had these, we have to approve them every year. But I want to be on the record as saying that I hope that this is not a new pattern forming, that we are getting information at the last moment. This, in my mind, is not an emergency issue because we know we're going to have a contract with the Sheriff's Department and the Police Department every year. Um, and so I, I, I'm not here to place blame. I just want to say that um, I realize school starts next week, two weeks. Um, but. I hope that in the future, we will not see something added this late. I think it's very fair, though, to make sure it's understood. It's not the uh, school board, school district, that is causing the lateness of the adding of this. But the people that we are working with were not willing to adjust their calendars and get this to us in a timely fashion. And there are some very important issues that were not resolved that we will still be meeting and working with them to bring uh, an addendum probably to this particular contract. But we have to have security, safety and uh, for our students starting the first day of school. And uh, I, I wanna make sure that uh, the city and the county have plenty of time to make sure that they are meeting their responsibilities. I don't have any problem thinking that we will meet our responsibility, our, our people are ready to go. But there are some issues with the city and the county for them to align people and place them in schools. Mr. Superintendent, do you have anything you want to add to this? 
Well, this contract certainly is very important and we appreciate the partnership with the Sheriff's Office and the Pensacola Police Department uh, to, to provide school resource officers. It's a, a vital service. Um, we, we did have um, a meeting, um, Ms. Payne and I, Ms. Payne, I think what it was a few weeks ago, I believe, that we uh, did have a meeting, certainly much later than um, we, we would have liked for that meeting to happen, but uh, we, w we did have some concerns with the contract and we're going to uh, move forward as best we can and um, hopefully as we continue forward, we can uh, continue to fine tune in the coming year. Sure. Okay, yes. Um, I also share Patty's concerns. Uh, I had a little while to look at it just before I came to the meeting. There's some issues in there that I need to address that I need to find out what the answers are to it. And uh, we got to make sure this does comply with the Mallory, Mallory Douglas Stoneman Act. It's not the sheriff. It's not the police chief. They all have to comply with that law. Mm -hmm. So this was a little late. I mean, I'm not going to block it again on the agenda, but... Uh, you know, I have I have concerns. I know we're going to try to pass something just to pass it to, to make changes later. But uh, if if they don't cooperate, there's an outlet for us. It's called the governor's office, and it's called the sec uh, education commissioner. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got to have a good guy with a gun mm -hmm. to stop a bad guy with a gun in the schools. So I saw some of these date notifications. How long before they? have to notify us that they're not going to be a deputy there and blah, blah, blah. So I, I've got some questions when we get to that agenda part section. We do have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended for good cause at this meeting. So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yes, sir. You did say that the attorney has said that this is legal for us to go forward in this met uh, method or manner, the timeline and everything. Madam Attorney. In with regard to these two contracts, yes. Uh, the original advertisement that was posted in June um, had a specific notice that said that additional items can be added to the agenda upon a showing of good cause. Thank you. Any other discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. All right, this, this time, um, Mr. Superintendent, I'll turn it over to you for a presentation by finance. Yes, we have uh, the finance for the tentative budget, the finance report for the tentative budget. I'm going to turn that over to Mr. St. Cyr for his presentation. Okay, thank you, sir. The tentative budget hearing is the step we're at now in the trim process. We advertise the bud this budget that you will see um, in the Pensacola News Journal on Tuesday. Uh, we're on day two, uh, which is uh, part of the trim process. From two to, two to five days after advertisement, we're to have our tentative budget hearing. So Ms. McCants will lead us through that entirely. She has put in an enormous amount of work in this. Just want to recognize her for that. So Ms. McCants, if you would. Thank you, Ms. McCants. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, like Mr. St. Cyr said, we have advertised it accordingly as required in the news journal. And now this meeting is to adopt the tentative budget and tentative millage rate. Before I get into the presentation of the actual budget, there is a handout. And I'm going to go over that first. This is some supplemental budget information. There are several spreadsheets. There's two pages with department budgets, two with projects. And the last spreadsheet, we're going to go over some general fund salary budgets. Okay, the first page, which would be the first two pages, are department budgets. 
each department received their budget um, and were told to, for their, to ask for their request and return it back to budgeting. And also, during this process, they were asked to reduce their budget by 3% if possible for the new year. The first two pages will show you the original budget for 2021. The second column is the tentative budget for the 22 fiscal year. The change between the two fiscal years and the dollar amount change from 2021. If you take a look at each call center, most call centers did reduce their budget. So they did a really good job going through each item, line item by object, function, and trying to find items that they could reduce their budget. And that second page of their department budget shows a savings of $185,076. Ms. McCants? Yes. On the first page, there, there's one facilities planning that's an increase rather than a decrease? Right. That's an increase because they have a project that they manage and what they did, they increased the department budget and decreased their project budget. Okay. So it all comes under facilities. They just did a swap between the projects. Okay, thank you. When we receive the budgets, each department also, if they have any requests for that are capital allowable, being any FF and E items, we go through, we take all the FF and E out of these budgets and put it in to capital. So any requests that came in through these call centers, we put them to millage because they are millage eligible. And so the results that you see, for instance, we would get a lot of requests for transportation or IT if they have any FF and E, those items have been re taken out of general and put into millage. I know this is your first time seeing this spreadsheet, so we do still have time. Final is not until September. So if there's any additional information you need about any of these budgets, please let us know. Okay, the next two pages are projects that departments are responsible for. And this is set up the same. We have each project 2021 budget and also we have the 2022 budget and any changes shows an increase or decrease as well as the dollar amount the difference between the projects and the call centers each call center is a department but on this on this project spreadsheet we also have budgets that we do give to schools if you look at the first one 0108 that is the depart, uh, school budgets that we allocate every year to the schools. That's their regular operating for their each location. It shows a decrease, but we did not decrease any school's budget in the 108. That's just because it's based on FTE. They all receive the same amount per FTE. May I ask a question? Um, I noticed that the outsource custodial is the same, so we did not have any increase in that contract. At this time, no, although we are looking at one or two other sites that we may actually add at a later date. We just didn't want to change everything right before the start of school. Mr. Chair, is, is that safe school allocation, that's categorical funding on it? From on this spreadsheet? Yes. This is not categorical. Not ca so the safe school district cost portion? Right. This is not the uh, safe so school what, what allocation. Does that, show? that is just, we use general fund portions, and that is what we use to pay security costs. Oh, security contract. costs, okay. Yes. Do 
you want me to go through any of these, just let me know. Any other? Prepare to review or questions. As you see on the second page with all the reductions, 3% increase in most call centers, um, we're down to, there was a savings of 295,746 for the new year. Of course, any project that had a contract in it, of course, we did not reduce it. As well as any school budgets, there's no reduction. Okay. Okay. We'll move on to the next spreadsheet, which is salaries. These are our major general fund salaries, the 0101. We have class size as well as SAI. Our current year budget, a total of 241, 593, 493. This shows the activity for the year of 2021. We have an increase from 21 and 22 in the 0101 salary budget. We also, if you look at 0720, you will notice a decrease that's categorical, and that is what our allocation is for the new year. So that's why we're decreasing the 0720 class size. So we're showing an increase of four million over actual 21. Of course, there's an increase in benefits for health and retirement. We're expecting an increase, so we're estimating two million. And also, we'll receive vacancies, that two million. We're budgeting for positions. They weren't filled, but we still budget for them in case they are filled. Mr. Chair, may I? Yes, ma'am. So the, uh, the vacancies that are budgeted, are these the ones that are reflected in the personal planning documents, or are these additional ones? These are all positions in the in the personnel planning document. Well, in, in the document itself, it'll have an asterisk and said this position being held open. So is, is that a different n vacancy than the ones that are reflected here? It's different because if it's held open, then we're just holding it. We don't plan to fill it. So, but you don't budget for it. Right, these are positions that we trying to fill, have not filled. Okay. But I'm th saying th that correctly. This is only a we're only budgeting a portion of the allocated or authorized positions. I don't remember what percentage, but we, we went through and budgeted a portion of uh, authorized positions that were unfilled. We know we'll never fill 100% of our positions, so we don't budget 100% of our positions. They'll think we're over padding the appropriations if we did that, and we would be. So we take a perc reasonable percentage of those positions, and this number will probably change between now and final, okay. and, and budget a portion of them just to have some budget capacity in case we hire some of those positions back. And one of those examples would be bus, driver, bus drivers. They're, they're in this too. So just figure a few bus drivers filling uh, that we haven't filled. We plan to fill those, so we budget them. Some of them, we, you know, so that, that's really the issue here. It is not a, it is not every position is not budgeted. Every position that's authorized is not budgeted because we know we'll never fill all of them. So we don't appropriate all of that. Does that make sense? If we have 100 <laughs> positions open, if we have 100 positions open right now, I, I understand what you're saying. I don't know whether everybody else does. I understand what you're saying. My, my question was basically, um, are these positions we want to fill? Yes, as opposed to those that are sometimes just decided that we will leave them vacant for this year. Correct. Okay. Okay, any more questions in reference to this handout? 
I think not. Okay. The tentative budget document has been linked. The first 29 pages is the district summary budget, which is the template that we receive from the state where we have budget for each fund. And what I'm going to do is go over sort of supplemental information which starts on page 30. I, I had quick, one quick question as you move through that. Um, there are several pages that are there without any funds in them. Correct. So would you explain that? I think I understand what they're, but you know, that they're there because it's gonna be money that's gonna hopefully come in. But I just wanted to make sure that we, we talked about that because Okay. There's no funds on those pages. Right. There are some that will not have any numbers because we don't have them, like permanent funds. There's, there's a few I think pages most of these are that federal. we will not have, but there are new pages due to the CARES Act that will have funds. And when we bring the final, we will budget more of those. Okay. Okay, on page 30. This shows each fund with the graph. It shows the percentage by fund. If you can see the general fund, 364.9 million. Food services, 27.7 million. We have federal programs. That's not Food Service or CARES Act, 43.9 million. We have the ESSER, which this some of these numbers were changed because when putting this together, year end had not ended. But at the time, we're projecting we're going to have 871,000 left to budget out of the 12.3 million allocation we received for ESSER 1. Okay, the CARES, the other special revenue, that's our GEAR funds and other small grants that we received. That was a total for the GEAR, we received 1.1 million. And we're projecting 170,000 that would carry over. This one ends August 31st. We did budget a portion of ESSER 2 and tentative for 34.4 million. And we will have this grant through September of 2023. We have our debt service funds, 18.6 million. We have all our capital project funds, 172.9 million which is our sales tax millage, CONDS funds. That gives us a total governmental fund of $663,784,970.47. We have our internal service funds, which are employee benefit funds and our risk management funds of $61,654,068.07. That brings us a total for our tentative budget of $725,439,038.54. Okay, page 31. This gives a breakdown of our general fund revenue estimates. Federal and federal through state, 3.5. Our state funds, which is our FEFP, class size and other smaller allocations, 202.2 million. Our property tax revenue, 99.1 million. And other local funds, 4.7 million. And other local, that's funds we receive local mostly, rent, uh, a lot of Georgetown fees we post to this other local child care fees. That brings us a total revenue of $309,582,596.09. We include the transfers in of $8,483,232. Transfers in, that's our insurance. We're able to transfer cash from millage to general fund to cover insurance premiums as well as maintenance expenditures. We have an estimated beginning fund balance at July 1 of
page 32, this gives a general fund budget breakdown by object. Of course, salaries and benefits, and it's been salaries and benefits being the largest part of our budget. Salaries, 197, 262, 9, 20, 65. Benefits of 63, 342, 22, 69. Purchase services, 30 million, 889, 225, 15. Energy services, 11 million, 9584. Materials and supplies, 11 million, 131, 488, 66. Capital outlay, 2 million, 382, 310, 91. And just to mention capital outlay, I know when people see that they think about other capital funds, but we actually, this is any expenditure that we would code to a six object. And we do have certain projects in the general fund where we do purchase equipment. So we have certain allocations like CAPE, turnaround, those are in the general fund, so we do purchase equipment in general fund for those projects. We have other expenditures of 7 million, 60,853.45. We have ending fund balance estimate of 41, 41,801,075. Okay, page 33 and 34 is our certif certification of school taxable value, which I did go over this last week. But I just want to reiterate a couple of numbers on this form again for everyone. A line four is our taxable value. That 23-238-782-742. And like I said before, this first section is completed by the property appraiser. Section two at the bottom. This is where we as a district fill in our millage rates that we're projecting to levy for the new year. Line 14, you can see the state rollback rate of 3.654, 15, shows the local board rollback rate of 2.003. 16 is the required local effort for the new year of 3.695. If you go down to 17, that's our capital outlay millage rate of 1.214. Discretionary operating, 0.748. The capital as well as the discretionary operating for general gives a total of 1.962 mills. If you take a look at page two, line 22 shows that we are not levying more than the rollback rate. Therefore, we do not have to advertise a tax increase. Okay, page 35, this shows proposed millage rates and the revenue that it is projected to generate based on the certified tax roll. And this is at 96%, not 100%. We have general fund required local effort, 82, 432.610. Our discretionary operating at 16, 687.305. That's a total for the general fund of $99,119,915. Our capital outlay, which is for millage of 1.214, would generate 2783407. That's a total of 126203322. Page 36, we show you a comparison of 2021 and 2122 as far as the millage rates. It comes to a total decrease of 0.271. Page 
also the certified tax roll. Under the 2021, that's the final taxable value for the prior fiscal year. And compare it to 22, that's a change of 1.4 million billion increase. Okay, page 37. This gives you an example of how the millage rates levy will affect taxpayers. If you look at 2021 and 21-22, you can see that it is a decrease due to the fact that we have a decrease in millage rates that we are proposing to levy. Okay, page 38, which gives a historical data for millage rates that the school board has levied starting from 1992 to the proposed 21-22. And as you see in the older years, if you look at the column next to the last, it's 2.0 because Two mil used to actually be two mil. That used to be the maximum we could levy, but now it's 1.5 is the maximum for capital outlay. Take a look at the right, far right. That's the total mills and how much we dropped from prior year just to issue, uh, to levy rollback rates. We don't know how long we can keep doing that, you know, honestly, because um, we, we may be okay from for the next year or two, but uh, with the inflation that we're experiencing and the things uh, and that m millage fund that we need to do, bus drive, bus school buses, who knows? I'm, I don't know. I don't have a read on what school buses are going to wind up costing in the next couple of years with the inflation. A factor there, so we we don't know if we can continue the levy uh, rollback rate, but we'll we'll do our best. But that'll be a lot of discussion, I'm sure, next time. Okay. The next page, 39, is also historical information in reference to analysis of our tax roll. If you look at the tax roll for 21-22, it's a 6.64 increase from prior year, 6.4 percent. Out of property. Okay, that's the end of all the supplemental information that's in the tentative budget book. The next section are the advertisement that were advertised in the newspaper on Tuesday. Any questions on any of the advertisements? <coughs> Mr. Chair, do we need to do the resolutions as part of this tentative budget? Because yes, yes, ma'am. I just wanted to make sure because it's not here so the resolution yeah I, they're they're not as part of the yeah i just didn't want us to forget them oh because right, they're yes. in the advertisements we do have to do the resolutions yeah. tonight yeah. yes <coughs> any other on questions the, on the agenda yes thank you okay, any thank other you. questions all right at this time <coughs> is there anyone here who would like to speak in public forum to the proposed tentative millage rates and tentative budget for the Escambia County School District for the school year 2021-2022. OK, 
Okay. Seeing no one, we will move on in to motions to vote uh, for the adoption of the tentative millage rates. <clears throat> so, who would like to start? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I move the adoption of the 2021-2022 20, 20, 20, tentative required local effort millage rate at 3.695 mills. Thank you, sir. Is there a second to this motion? I'll second that. Thank you very much. Is there any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Next, someone for discretionary and operating. Mr. Chairman, I move the adoption of the 2021-2022 tentative discretionary operating millage rate at 0 0.748. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you very much. Any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Next for the local capital improvement. Mr. Chairman, I move the adoption of the 2021-2022 tentative local capital improvement, in parentheses capital outlay, millage rate at 1.214. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you very much. Any discussion? If not, please vote. <coughs> Motion carries 5-0. <coughs> and last, the uh, total millage. Mr. Chairman, I move the adoption of the 2021-2021-2022 tentative total millage rate at 5.657. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. All right. Moving on to item 5, which is the adoption of the 21-22 tentative budget. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the 2021-2022 tentative general fund budget in the amount of $364,960,413.26. Thank you very much. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's fine. Either one of us, Holly. Yeah. <laughs> Take your pick, Holly. Okay. <coughs> and any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to special revenue. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the 2021-2022 tentative special revenue food services budget in the amount of $27,741,665. Thank you. Second. Second. Any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. And the next one, federal programs. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the 2021-2022 tentative special revenue federal programs budget in the amount of $43,974,771.09. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Any your questions, discussions, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. <coughs> Next, CARES Act. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the 2021-2022 tentative special revenue CARES Act ESSER budget in the amount of $871,899.66. Thank you. Do I have a budget? Do I have a budget? Do I have a second? Second. Any questions? Any discussion? No. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. CARES Act other. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the 2021-2022 
tentative special revenue cares act other budget in the amount of one hundred seventy thousand five hundred nineteen dollars and sixty cents thank you in the uh, second second thank you any discussion <coughs> if not please vote I'm sorry, could you revote, please? Really? Dr. Adler, we need We had to revote. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, two. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the 2021 2022 tentative special revenue ESSER 2 budget in the amount of $34,418,040. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you very much. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion carries 5 0. Debt service funds. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the 2021 2022 tentative debt service funds budget in the amount of $18,681,634. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Capital project funds. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the 2021-2022 tentative capital project funds budget in the amount of $172,966,000 $27.83. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Internal service funds. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the 2021-2022 <coughs> tentative internal service funds budget in the amount of $61,654,068.07. Do I have a second? Second. Do we have any need for discussion? Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Let's go the total budget. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the 2021-2022 tentative total budget in the amount of $725,439,038.54. Do I have a second? Second. Do we have any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, next, the item Sattel was talking about, the adoption of resolution. Do I have a motion for the adoption of the resolution number 2022-01? Mr. Chairman, I move the adoption of the resolution number 2022-01, a resolution of the Scheme County School Board adopting the tentative millage rates for fiscal year 2021-2022. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Next one. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the resolution number 2022-02, a resolution of the Scheme County School Board adopting a tentative budget for fiscal year 2021-2022. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. <laughs> Next, we need to move into we have to setting set the date. The time, date, and location of the final budget meeting with the guidance from Mr. St. Cyr. And I, I, it's on here. I move that kay. the final budget hearing be held Thursday, September 16th, 2021 at 5.01 p.m., in the school board chambers, room 160 of the J.E. Hall Center. Thank you very much. In case anybody didn't catch all that, September the 16th, 5.01 p.m., location, 
this room, room 160 of the J.E. Hall Center. Do I have a second? I'll second. And Duo seconded. Okay. Any discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. <coughs> now moving into item nine, uh, we, an agreement between the Escambia County, uh, the school board of Escambia County and the sheriff's office. Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the agreement between the school board of Escambia County, Florida the Escambia County, Florida Sheriff's Office for the School Resource Officer Program as presented. Thank you very much. Do I have a second? If not. I'll second for discussion. Okay. Do we need discussion? Yes. Uh, and I, and I'm, what I'm zeroing in on is on page 4 of 12. Okay, and what I want to know from the attorney, because we have to know if there's not going to be a sheriff deputy, and I'll go with the city too, or a city police officer in our schools according to state law. Okay, and I'm seeing these where they, they can notify just that morning they're not going to be there. Does this comply with the state law of trying to get, because there's no... I mean, if something happens and we don't have a good guy there with a gun, and if it's the city police chief or the, our, our Chip Simmons or the sheriff, we're all in hot water, okay? So that's what I want to make sure. But because this was presented so quick, and I hadn't had a chance to even look it over to see about any arrest issues, but if you want to tell me if that at least complies with state law. There's nothing in state law that specifies what needs to be contained in our contract. It's my understanding that the superintendent met with Mr. Simmons and was assured that they would give us everything that we need. Um, this was one of the areas that we did attempt to get some additional language in. Um, I, I say we, uh, it was our safe, safety specialist. Um, but um, it, it's, it's definitely a gaping hole in this contract um, and it would if that were to come to pass uh, we would be required to notify the Department of uh, that we had a lapse in our school safety coverage and that is something that we do hope to work out with the law enforcement agencies hopefully in very short order but this is something that just it it, it for whatever reason came up very quickly on this deadline and we find ourselves in this position of having to have SROs in place, having to have a contract uh, is preferable to being in complete violation and just hoping that perhaps they may show up in the absence of a contract. Okay, Ms. Hightower? Um, I too was concerned with the same thing as Mr. Adams and I wanted to ask, I don't, I don't see um, Kyle here, but Mr. Dennis, do we have a class about to start or a class started? with our guardians? We actually have a class ongoing as we speak. How many are in that uh, class? We started with 16. I'm happy to tell you that after our initial um, range qualifications and our night fires, we still have 15, which is an all-time record for us. Uh, they will be pursuing their active shooter um, training portion, which is another kind of a calling point uh, next week, and hopefully, will have a, a substantial number, probably one of the highest pass rates we anticipate that we've had in a while. So it's very encouraging right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair, may I? I just, um, I just wanted to ask that question because I believe, um, I understand that the, the Sheriff's Department and the Police Department, their obligation is to the citizens of this community. Um, but as Mr. Adams was speaking about, um, you know, it is on us to make sure that we have coverage every day. In fact, we were, we were um, called out because we had people, had schools that not, were not covered all day, every day. And so, um, you know, if we can continue to work on this, and, and as, as I know, school is starting, but I know that there's language in this contract that allows us to start without it, because it says it, when it gets approved, we go back and pay them for time that they've already served, so to speak. Um, 
but um, there was a, and this is kind of, um, okay, it, it comes up in the next contract, um, but uh, I, I do want to express the same thing, and I also want to say thank you to both the Sheriff's Department and the Police Department for working with us. Um, I know a lot of districts don't have that luxury that we do in having them support us and help us with the cost. And so I do want, I don't want to, I don't want to sound ungrateful, but um, you know, we've got to figure out a way that we can all be happy with this. Um, Cause it, I, I totally understand that if there's a, an issue where they have to pull, um, I, I, and I know um, protection services works hard at keeping some extra people around. So when they find that out, we get somebody uh, hopefully there. Uh, so I appreciate you, your comments, Mr. Adams. Mr. Uh, Fesco, you have any comments? I see the need for us having this contract in place. I don't know if, if we don't have the contract, if the sheriff's deputies will continue to serve and uh, you know, without the contract, they most certainly have been very cooperative and, uh, and most likely would. I feel better about having the contract and making amendments in the future. And I've been very happy with our protection services being able to fill those gaps and, and do the things that need to do to make sure the coverage is there. So at this point, rather than not having a contract at all, I am in favor of going forward and amending as we go into this next school year at uh, following meetings. Thank you, sir. Dr. Edler, any comments? Okay, that's okay. We need something in place. Yes, we need some documentation in place. Uh -huh. um, uh, and giving us an opportunity, uh, as Mr. Fetzka said, to make some amendments. Uh, because I'm, I'm wondering what happens if we expect a deputy or officer to be there. And, and we get a call that that person is not going to be there, even though that's in the contract. What do we do then? And that's the question we're trying to answer and work toward having a uh, fail-safe response to that. And uh, we have to have, I think the number one thing is that our principals must immediately know who to get in touch with to say, hey, I, I'm without an, a, a resource officer. Absolutely. And uh, do that quickly and may cost us a little money, but we, we have to have safety on our campuses. All right, any uh, other discussion? Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, Mr. Dennis, are we, are you believe that we may have enough guardians to cover this when we have a vacancy at the schools? So we are in a position where we're, we would love to get to a point where we have our standard two SRO sworn officers in our high schools an SRO in every one, if not two, in every middle school, and then use guardians for all of our elementaries. We do not have enough, obviously, to do that now. Um, if we're successful with this class, right now we're down to 22 guardians. Realistically, we could have as many as 10 succeed, which puts us to 32. You can do the math. That means we could conceivably cover all of our elementaries, but that would leave us no floaters. So we're going to need at least one more class to get to a full coverage scenario, but we will be far better positioned than we've ever been before after this class. And Mr. Chair, um, the increase in cost of 140,000 is that is a little plus. Is that for ex additional SROs or or what? There's some additional ones. Additional there's ones going in there. There's okay. I think three at the at the sheriff and there's. That's correct. The, what, sheriff, what the sheriff has committed, or uh, and correct me if I'm well, wrong, there's 18 Payne, three from the sheriff, and I forget how many from the police. And, but they've, they've changed the rank of their supervisors, too. Okay. The, the, my understanding from the sheriff's department, there's been a request for three SROs, but that still has to go okay. before their board. I think it, Mr. Fetzko, something else? I'd, <coughs> I'd like to, to make sure that we have in place somewhere in somebody's operating procedures of something that's gonna alert people to start the contract procedures 
with enough time to finish this before we get to a point like this. So, and I don't want to find out, and I'm not wanting to point fingers or anything else, but I'd like to make sure that whether we now determine that it's gonna be in this department or this person's responsibility, that there's something set up as a reminder that every May, the negotiations begin for the contract to come in in a timely manner before we get to the opening of school. Okay. I agree. Um, Madam Attorney, would you, can you tell me anywhere in the, the law, does it say how many SROs you have to have at a school? I'm not aware of that off the top of my head. Um, I do not know either. that they've recently come up with some modifications as far as allowing if there are joint campuses. If so, for instance, if you've got a joint uh, middle school and elementary school, you can have one officer that covers both. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Dennis might actually be more clued into that than I am. Because I thought that was what they dinged us on, was by, that we had. By number of students, how many? Yeah. Th this is something that's more recent, so it, oh, may okay. be that it may be that these things developed after the audit. Just to, to be clear, uh, Ms. Hightower, what we were, the finding that we had when the Office of Safe School audited was no officer present on two schools, uh, particularly up in the north end. Okay. It was not numbers or, or okay. some FTE Thank count. You. Right. I will tell you that we benefit greatly by having two at the high schools, not only to serve the, the size of the populations we, we serve in those schools, but the sheriff and the PPD are very, very cooperative. If we find ourselves with a shortfall, it's not uncommon for them to move a, an SRO, one from the high school to an adjacent campus, maybe for an interim while someone has to go in and come back. So their flexibility is markedly improved and they've gotten, they've been incredibly cooperative and I think we need to recognize that and we'll continue to negotiate. Good, thank you. Anything uh, else? Just one more question. Um, Mr. Dennis, if we could not get a police officer at that school and we didn't have a guardian, do we have a private source we can go to? Actually, what we have, one of our two safety officers in protection services is still a qualified guardian. Oh, okay. So we have our complement of guardians, plus we have a safety officer, and he does, Shannon does fill in occasionally. Yeah, he's, he's exceptional, just like all of our guardians. Um, so we have that as a fail safe, but we actually have built in a four floater, regionalized four floater program with our guardians. Because as you can imagine, every morning at five o'clock, we're checking who, because officers get sick too, they have call outs. And our guys do a fantastic job of, you know, by six o'clock they know, and we'll fire off a guardian or, or we'll contact the, the lieutenants or the sergeants and, and they'll find us somebody. And, and they've been appreciably better than things have been in the past. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add, um, we certainly uh, value and appreciate, as has been expressed here, the partnership between the Sheriff's Office and the Pensacola Police Department. We are very thankful for them, and uh, we will, um, as we move through this next year, we will uh, continue to try to improve what we have in place. Um, and. Uh, I take ownership for the uh, the timeline here. I, I apologize for having you as a board in this position, um, we'll, and um, thank you for your support in whatever decision you make. And I, I know you, it's a, a difficult situation with school coming up quickly, but um, certainly thank you for the, the the discussion that's taken place here. Thank you. If no more discussion, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. Number 10. Chair, I make a motion to approve the agreement between the School Board of Escambia County, Florida and the City of Pensacola Police Department for the School Resource Officer Program as uh, presented for the agenda. Thank you, do I have a second to this motion? I second. Thank you very much. Any discussion? Ma'am? Um, I just noticed um, in my brief time with the document. In the sheriff's uh, contract, there is a, 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 an additional expenditure on page seven of 12, where it indicates that we will 
share part of the cost for our resource officers to go to the Florida Association of School Resource Officers Conference, but that is not in the police contract in, in the Pensacola Police Department. Are they not allowed to go to that conference or? Or do we just not support them? <laughs> uh, I honestly wish I had an answer to that, ma'am. I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but I'll certainly find out as quickly as possible. Because I, I would like to, for all of our SROs to be able to attend if there's a conference right. and a training I, I will for them tell you to that do. That language or that omission of language has n never been in their contract. So my assumption would be, since the PPD has reviewed this year after year, that there's probably not something equivalent at that level. But I don't know. I'll find out for you. Okay, any other discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Chair, if I might, um, that was in the PPD officer. Um, there is a provision under financing of the school resource officer program, subsection A, that does say that the school board will pay 50% of the costs associated with their attendance at state and what national conferences. What page is that on? It's on. Because um, I couldn't find it. Article uh, 4. Article 4. Okay, thank you. So you're saying they are both covered by s the same language? Okay, I just couldn't find it. Good. Okay. That's good. It is good. All right. So at this time, we're going to move into public forum. Uh, I have requests from three individuals. Uh, the first one is Christine Harper, and she is donating her time to James. The second one is James, but, uh, and uh, then Mr. Ronald Jarin. Mr. Jarin is also donating three minutes to uh, Dr. James Harper. So, Dr. Harper, you have nine minutes if you need it. If you don't, that's up to you. So, uh, if you'll come forward, and uh, Hickey is speaking on COVID-19 mitigation. Okay, um, uh, my name is James Harper. Uh, uh, I'm an optometrist in the area. Um, I've uh, spoken before the board uh, before. I'm happy to see some previous faces I've seen. I believe there are uh, uh, other people here I uh, haven't seen before. But uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you all uh, members of the school board and superintendent for the welcoming uh, spirit here today. I come before the board today in the hopes of uh, spurring further thoughtful dis discussion that I suspect will continue hereafter on an issue that <coughs> uh, given a recent rise in Delta variant fueled COVID-19 infections has become more pressing namely the matter of how we can assist each other in approaching COVID-19 mitigation measures and the best way we can reflect the best interests of everyone in the district. Um, I, had, uh, I had described uh, some of my credentials in the past. Um, as I say, I am a um, optometrist in the community. Uh, since my time as a resident at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, 
that has become Salus University many years ago, in which I was involved with teaching optometry students. Um, I've been serving with patients, uh, I've been serving patients of all stripes, including in my range of experience, many pediatric patients from age seven and above uh, in Escambia County for over 10 years. And as a doctor of optometry, my education and training included many aspects of eye disease and systemic health. Uh, doctor of optometry board exams for new optometrists routinely test for competency in systemic fields, including uh, the fields of virology and epidemiology. As I come before the, the board today, both as a proud parent of two young students in the district and as a professional in healthcare in the community, I continue to offer and hope to act as a resource as the board and the superintendent, I believe are keeping the possibility of further changes in uh, COVID-19 mitigation measures in mind. As we all learn uh, more about the state of affairs in this regard, as the pandemic uh, continues. Um, so, <clears throat> ah, fix my thing. <laughs> so since we are uh, in a forum of education, I hope the chairman and others will indulge and consider some history. Infectious disease, government health care measures, issues around the safety of treatments, vaccinations, are all nothing new to American public life. George Washington, in an act of reasoned le leadership, conducted the first mass military inoculation. His move was unpopular to undertake for the Continental Army, but Washington did it because reason told him it was the right thing to do. The Congress and the ar Army ultimately followed him with general success in the effort because they were convinced they were educated to understand the risk and how it would help them accomplish their cause. This was during the revolution and it helped um, to ensure that the, the troops were, were ready and able to um, fight and achieve their cause. <clears throat> Although science today over time has greatly improved, the basic paradigm of, of a uh, major infectious disease is similar to what it was centuries and decades ago. Obviously, to some extent, it is a personal problem of many individuals when you have a lot of people um, contracting a disease, but ultimately it is in essence a problem of public health for all. The conclusion today seems inescapable that COVID-19 must be stopped by the people acting in unity. Mass health measures, mass vaccinations, <clears throat> they continue to be in our future with regard to this pandemic. We're not, we're not quite there yet um, because of issues I think of you know, requiring the full FDA um, authorization of the COVID-19 vaccines. But <clears throat> when we think about it, smallpox, polio, mumps, measles, they were all defeated by mass vaccination. And they were facilitated by school districts. So I think, I think we have to consider you know, that's coming towards our future and how, you know, what policies we, we look at right now have to align with a future that I think we're coming to. So <clears throat> currently, as we start the new school year, several uh, uh, organizations have given public health guidance to look at returning to a high degree of masking um, in indoor spaces to mitigate the effects of COVID-19. So as we consider that policy, um, 
I, I wanted to just, you know, with the short time I have, um, ask you to consider that um, if we start the school year in, with such policies that essentially um, send the message totally optional masking, the message, you know, that I think comes across is, you know, the, the pandemic is over or it isn't or never was a big deal. And that's a problem in the short term in terms of control of, of the virus. And I have multiple studies to show the effectiveness of, merit, of mask wearing and not just the effectiveness of it, but the very high likelihood that we are going to um, greatly help the, the spread of a much more transmissible virus um, with policies that are too lax. And if we're starting with that kind of a message this year, how then are we going to flip around as we move forward and say, it wasn't that big of a deal. You don't even have to wear a mask. But now we want you all to get vaccinated because it's so serious. That, I, I, as a public health matter, I think that's going to be a difficult thing to sell. And I think we have to we have to be a little bit more reasoned and consider the beginning of our country and the risks, for instance, that George Washington had in mind. How, you know, how was he going to lead? Um, I have a number of studies um, which very much show that the, door, the board did the right thing last year, very much so. And I greatly compliment the board. The, the science is much more convincing now than it was then of the effect, effectiveness of the public health measures that uh, the board and the superintendent took. And I think we have to continue those in, in, in some degree. I think the- Sir, your time's up. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, again, I do uh, offer to continue to be a resource. Um, I know some members had some things I was discussing with them, and I have researched them more, and I can provide a lot more information on this topic, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if this is a current item that the superintendent and the health staff here are working on. Yes. And uh, you want to have any, any comments, sir? Y yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we are currently working on this situation. Uh, received some information from the health department earlier this week. Um, and it was um, information that we had solicited uh, and we will be meeting tomorrow to vet this out further and to um, really try to come up with the best uh, best steps uh, that are available for the school year coming up. So our, our goal is early next week, but um, the, the one thing we do want to do is when we come up with some guidelines that they're they're going to be the right guidelines and um, good for our, our kids and our staff and our, our schools. Yeah, I think it's most important that you understand that, number one, our main concern is the safety of the students and the safety of the employees, and that we're going to do everything we can to uh, keep them. It's easy to say, do this, but it's not always popular, and uh, so we uh, I think all of us in agreement that we will follow the directions the superintendent and the health department comes up with 
and then we will try to work to uh, enforce those and uh, uh, make people understand we do these things because we are concerned about safety just mm -hmm. like approving a, 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 a SRO contract that's safety this is safety too so thank you very much sir appreciate it anything else mr. superintendent I do not have anything else mr. Chairman. anything thank else you. from the members of the board I yesterday the um, news media channel 3 had statements from both Santa Rosa and Okaloosa County about proposed plans for COVID mitigation and and I'm hoping that we'll have something then prior to students coming on campus I think that's y yes that is the the goal is I'd, I'd hoped for um, earlier this next coming week is is the goal and um, I've been in communication with those two uh, superintendents as well um, thank you sir the, w one of the things that w I, just to, to clarify one of the things that was a little different is uh, we were still um, gathering information from the health department so that was that was a factor in the timeline we appreciate their efforts but it seems like things are changing <laughs> and so we just have to be prepared and uh, so yes yes ma'am I just want to say thank you to Martha Hanna and the staff for keeping up our dashboard because I think where others have taken it down to not be as transparent we are trying to be transparent trying to communicate um, about the positivity rates in our community and I think that's that's valuable information for parents and I, I hope that we can get that information out to our staff as quickly as possible because I, I know that as I visited schools you know there there are those cases out there that that are already impacting yeah. those stu teachers coming back so and I appreciate the fact that we are going to continue with our our sanitation and our our, our um, hand washing and all of those things because even without COVID it's a good step to keep our kids <laughs> less uh, sick so very true anything else sir superintendent want to give an update on the plane crash at Blue Angel on what happened just so the public knows yes yeah, so there was a, a plane crash at Blue Angel in the parking lot um, did not make contact with the building but uh, certainly was close um, uh, thoughts and prayers go for the people who were on the plane our understanding is all three are at the hospital uh, one of them was a Blue Angels teacher and a spouse and then a, a, a minor. Um, so please lift your, your thoughts and prayers to, to the family. Remarkable job by our school uh, leadership team who was there. Um, principal provided really rather uh, incredible heroic uh, assistance there, helping the, the, the people in the, in the plane. And um, we're just very thankful that that our, our principal was there to provide incredible assistance, um, really made a difference uh, there, and um, thank the, the entire staff at that school for, for all of their support. And we, again, wish, wish the people in the, who were in the plane the very best uh, and fortunate to have great medical care in our community to, our first to assist them. Got her good. Yes, thank you very much. Anything else? If not, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.